Hi, and welcome to chapter 13. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at linked genes and abnormal chromosomes. As we learned in chapter 12 as well, chapter 13 describes that Mendel's findings were really based on purely conceptual deductions of the findings from his pea plants. He actually had no idea about the genes that were passed from parents to offspring, the actual particles he suggested this was happening, but he did not actually know that they were inherited through genes. These traits were inherited through genes. And remember from chapter 12 that Mendel didn't actually receive much credit for his work. And it was until, wasn't until not until after his death that his work became important. And scientists started looking into what could be inherited from parents to get these observable traits in the offspring. So by the 1900s, microscopy became well-developed and the technology became much better. And they started looking at what could possibly be passed on from the parents to offspring to generate these traits. Today, our staining and microscopy techniques are quite advanced. And they can start at a very basic level, like the cells that we've seen in the lab. For instance, during the mitosis lab, we looked at whitefish blastula and the different stages of mitosis. We did that with the onion root cells as well. And we also see that these techniques can be used to generate images like this one shown here, as well as karyotypes that we've seen in previous lectures, and I'll show you one in a few slides. So today we know that chromosomes are thread-like structures. Remember in a previous lecture, we talked about how DNA is wrapped around histone proteins and condensed and condensed further until we get these chromosomes. We know that along the length of our chromosomes, we have unique genes. So here I might have a gene, here I might have another gene. And these are where we find our genetic information that are going to encode proteins. And we'll see that in a future chapter. After Gregor Mendel's findings, several other scientists came about to develop um, the chromosomal theory of inheritance, which really supported the findings of Gregor Mendel. Walter Sutton and Theodore Bovary really started this theory, the chromosomal theory of inheritance, and Eleanor Carruthers, shown on the right, really provided physical evidence supporting the theory. So some aspects of the theory include that each pair of homologous chromosomes sorts randomly and independently of the other chromosome pairs, and we saw this in our meiosis lecture. And we know also from meiosis that male and female gametes, the sperm and egg, have half the genetic material compared to the parent cell. Remember, gametes are haploid, parent cells are diploid. Diving into the chromosomal theory of inheritance, we see several aspects that remind us of meiosis. So remember from meiosis, homologous chromosomes migrate as discrete structures. We saw that homologous pairs assort randomly during metaphase one, and they'll be randomly assorted into their gametes. We also learned that parent cells were diploid, but during the generation of gametes, once they're formed, these gametes will be haploid. They only have half the number of chromosomes as the parent cells. And even though male and female gametes differ in size, remember the female egg is much larger than the male sperm cell. Both of these are haploid, and they still have the same number of chromosomes, 23 in each. Whereas in the parent cell, there are 46 or 23 pairs of chromosomes. And then finally, when the sperm fertilizes the egg, you regenerate that diploid number where you have 46 total chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. Now, if I take those aspects of the theory and look at it in terms of a picture, this is what I get. So I can see that this is the parental generation, and we said that for our class, the parental generation will always be true breeding. So I have one parent with yellow and round seeds on the left, and this is a diploid cell, and I see their gamete will only have one of each, so this is haploid. And then the same thing is true on the right. I have a green wrinkled seed. This is diploid, but the gamete will be haploid. The second image also shows how aspects of meiosis align with the chromosomal theory of inheritance. So if we look at the right side, remember that the law of independent assortment tells us that homologous chromosomes 
assort independently from one another. So on this side, for example, we have small r, big R, big Y, small y, and they are lining up with blue and red on the left and red and blue on the right, and that'll generate a different set of gametes. But on the left, they have red, red, blue, blue on the right, red, red on the left, and this tells us that the first set of chromosomes, the shape of the seed, align differently and randomly compared to the color of the seed. On the left side, the law of segregation, this tells us how we get from diploid parent cells to haploid gametes. So remember, the law of segregation is that the two alleles for each gene will separate. So big R and small r separate, for example, and you end up with haploid gametes. Here we're separating as well in the center, also ending up with haploid gametes. Going back to the chromosomal theory of inheritance, just like Gregor Mendel's findings, this theory was proposed before there was direct evidence that traits were carried on those chromosomes through genes. Bovary and Sutton worked on sea urchins and grasshoppers and found that chromosomes occurred in matched maternal and paternal pairs, just as Gregor Mendel found, and these segregated in meiosis to create those haploid gametes. And then Eleanor Carruthers also demonstrated independent assortment in chromosomes in her studies using grasshoppers. Looking at sex link traits, as we saw at the end of the previous chapter, it was really Thomas Hunt Morgan's work on our fruit flies, the Drosophila, that showed that there could also be genes that are specifically linked to certain sex chromosomes. Um, our example from chapter 12, the previous chapter, was eye color and the X chromosome. As we learned in the previous chapter, chapter 12, Fruit flies, the wild type, have red eyes, and this is located on the X chromosome, whereas the mutant type of fruit flies have white eyes. We use Drosophila as a model for genetic studies because they can produce a ton of offspring very quickly, so they usually produce hundreds of offspring in every generation. You can breed a new generation about every two weeks. And in terms of their chromosomes, they're similar to humans in that they have three sets of autosomes that are not sex related and one pair of sex chromosomes. So if I look at the human karyotype on the right, I know that chromosomes 1 through 22 are autosomes, as we saw in the previous chapter. So these are not related to sex, and we know that these are arranged by size for the most part. And we have one pair of sex chromosomes, that's our 23rd pair. And it looks like this is a male because I can see a Y chromosome there. So as we saw at the end of chapter 12, the previous chapter, Thomas Hunt Morgan found that the gene for eye color was related to sex. And that was in fact because it was located, the gene for eye color was located on the X chromosome. And this was really the first demonstration that genes were located on chromosomes. So Thomas Hunt Morgan's work with sex linkage showed that the traits for sex and eye color were always inherited together. And this violated Mendel's second law because this meant that these genes, these traits, did not segregate independently of one another. When they looked at other traits more closely, they found that if genes are located on the same chromosome, so if I draw a chromosome like this, and I have a gene here, and for maybe I have another gene right there, so they're located on the same chromosome, then they may not segregate independently. Sometimes they can segregate, however, independently of each other. It really depends on how far apart the two genes are from one another on the same chromosome. So these two genes are pretty close together. But if I have another chromosome, and let's say, the genes are pretty far apart from one another, maybe they're on opposite arms, then the further apart they are, the more likely they will segregate independently of one another. So again, far apart chromosomes segregate independently or are more likely to segregate independently, but if they're closer together, they're less likely to segregate independently. And the reason that chromosomes on the, sorry, genes on the same chromosome have the ability to segregate independently is because of crossing over. 
So if you have genes that are far apart on the same chromosome, then crossover occurs much more frequently. But if they're close together, crossing over happens much less frequently. So again, further apart like the one up here, crossing over is more frequent. But if they're closer together like this one, it's less common or less likely for crossing over to occur. That takes us to the end of our first video for chapter 13. In the next video, I'm going to walk you through a specific example of inheritance patterns of unlinked and linked genes in the fruit fly or our Drosophila.